Here we go. So in the last video, you guys asked a whole bunch of questions and that was awesome. In fact, I didn't even think that you guys were going to be asking that many questions. So here we are. We're going to go ahead and we're going to answer some questions for you. I guess we can probably just do a quick introduction. So I'm Dakota. I'm Jesse. Ashton. Jose. And uh, yeah, so we are all first year dental students at Midwestern. Just to kind of give you guys a disclaimer, this probably goes without saying, we obviously don't have all of the answers for dental school or for what you guys want to know, but we have our opinions on things and hopefully that gives you an idea of what to expect when dental school comes around. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The first question is, is this a better way to go to dental school after becoming a dental hygienist? and do dentists really have a great lifestyle? So I guess there's like two questions here. I think the question's asking, is it better to go to dental hygiene school before you go to dental school? I'm gonna say maybe. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's certainly not going to be like a bad thing to go to dental hygiene school, but I think if you if your end goal you already know that you want to be a dentist, then I say just go ahead and do what you got to do to be a dentist instead of actually going on to be a dental hygienist. It's kind of unnecessary, but if you already started as a dental hygienist, then that's certainly going to help you in your quest to actually go on and, and be a dentist. Um, also, do dentists have a great lifestyle? Yes. <laughs> Well, I can't really answer this question, but it's asking, how do you balance having a family with dental school? I don't really have a family here with me. Yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah, balancing family with dental school, it can be hard sometimes, but I don't know. I think that the way that I do it is I know that there's a ton of stuff that I have to do throughout the day, and this is definitely no different for these guys as well. Like we have tons of stuff that we have to study, uh, basic sciences, and lab projects and those kinds of things. And so when we're doing those specific things, we're giving 100% of our time and 100% of our focus into that one thing that we're doing at that one point in time. So hopefully that, that helps. Uh, SB asks, would you consider dental school to be a bad decision if you get squeamish, squirmish over blood? I would definitely say try to build up your tolerance if that's something that you're really concerned about because it would really suck if you showed up and passed out the first day, that'd be kind of bad. So I think the best thing to do in that kind of situation is do a lot of shadowing and see if you can get used to it. I, I even feel like I get kind of squirmish. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I, I, I just a little tiny bit, but like Ashley was saying, like if you do a lot of shadowing your hours at a dental office, you'll kind of get used to the environment. You might see some extractions and if that type of thing doesn't really bother you, then I would say you're, you're pretty fine. Okay, right. Next question. Oh, zip. Oh, zip. <laughs> okay, so ENL asks, so which CSU schools are good for following the potential? Are you guys uh, from California? I'm from California. Oh. Um, I think the best answer that I can give you is any school is going to have a good preparation for you. Uh, like when I was applying to schools, I applied to all the California schools, whether they were state or private, just because chances are they tend to accept people from that state a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know if uh, going, for, going to a CSU school would help like, put you at a better advantage over other students that get them. I think it's more just based on your GPA, your dad score, and extracurriculars. I'm not sure if the school in particular really matters. I think as long as you're going to like an actual university instead of going to like a community college. If you're going to a community college, that's a completely different story because some um, admissions committees don't like that you've taken prereqs at community colleges, that kind of thing. But aside from that, I, nothing I, I can think all right. <laughs> Lisa Matheson 2 says, what are the names of all the dental instruments? <laughs> um, I'll have to get back to you on that because there's a lot, but um, we did actually learn uh, a few dental instruments. We don't know all of them because like I said, we're first year students. Um, so we eventually will, and I'll probably get to this in another video. For now, we can tell you that, um, so as a dentist, you have to do exams on patients, and one of the uh, kits that you'll use is just a basic exam kit, uh, which has a mirror, there's an explorer, which is kind of the thing that has like a little hook. Aside from that, there's like these big tweezers, they're called cotton pliers, or college pliers, or college forceps, I don't know, and uh, a perio probe. That's about all I can tell you right now. 
Hope that helps. They're instruments, not tools. Yes, that's <laughs> that is huge. So pet peeve for basically all dental schools everywhere is uh, don't call dental instruments tools because then they'll call you Bob the Builder. All right, this, this question is from Benjamin. He's asking, do you plan to specialize? Um, you know, I'm gonna give the cliche answer that everyone gives and just, you know, I'll keep my options open right now, I'm not sure. I try, I try to keep my grades as high as I can. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> General dentistry is awesome. You can do almost anything. Unless you wanna do something really crazy like maxillofacial surgery and you wanna do trauma reconstruction. Or, I mean, if you wanna do like high volumes of uh, orthodontics, you know, maybe you want to go into like the residency. Besides from that, yeah, you can pretty much do anything you want as a general dentist. When you apply to dental school, does your class rank go on the transcript, or is it just your GPA? It's just your yeah. GPA. Just your GPA. Just your GPA. GPA. Just your GPA. So at least on my transcript, it just had the GPA. I don't even know what my class rank was. Yeah, I don't even know that either. So <laughs> no. How strongly would you recommend to take a ceramics class? Um, I never took any art classes or anything of that, and I feel like I'm doing pretty well in, uh, in our waxing classes. I feel like overall you, you will learn to develop those skills in dental school. There are definitely some more artistic people in our class, which I feel like, you know, they do have that advantage and they're looking at a little bit quicker pace. But I think overall, you know, you will all eventually get to that same. I don't think it's really necessary, but, you know, if you want to do it, more power to you. I never took a ceramics class or anything like that in my undergrad. I will say, however, that in one of the interviews, there was one interview where the, uh, the interviewers asked me if I had taken a pottery class or like a ceramics class. And I was not expecting that. I won't tell you what school it is because that's unfair. But um, needless to say, I didn't get accepted to that school. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Maybe if you take a ceramics class, you'll get accepted to that one school. Philtastic One asks, why did you choose a private school rather than a public? dental school? It's actually a really good question. One that I think every dental, every pre-dental student should ask themselves. Should I go to a private school or a public school? First of all, if the public dental school offers the same amount of things as a private dental school, pick the public school every single time because it's going to be so much cheaper um, for you in the long run. The dental school that we go to is really expensive. But with that being said, um, we get so much out of it because of it. And that is actually the reason why I chose this school. I actually got accepted to a public school and I could have gotten a lot cheaper tuition for, for that school, but it really didn't offer as many things as this school did. So for example, before we graduate, we are pretty much guaranteed to place at least four implants. And that's not just restoring implants, um, but actually surgically placing them. And that was a huge thing for me. I wanted to make sure that I had the opportunity to do that. And that's one thing that almost no dental school will offer. So to be able to have that opportunity is really cool. Uh, another thing as well is just like there's laser certification. You'll be uh, certified in like seven different types of lasers. Invisalign, you'll be certified in that. Tons of different types of root canals, definitely molar endo for sure. Tons of crowns, whether it's just like the normal kind sent out to a lab or uh, the CAD CAM crowns, we do tons of those. And so the clinical experience, being able to do that. Um, another thing as well is like, we don't have any residents at our school. And that's one thing that you'll see a lot with state schools is there's residents for like endodontics or periodontics or ortho or, you know, that kind of thing. And if there are residents there and you have a really cool case, a lot of times you actually have to take that case and give it to the residents because that's what they're there for. And to kind of sort of expound on that, public versus private, I'm considered an international student, so pretty much my only option is a private school since uh, most uh, public schools kind of tend to be more towards your state students. And with that as well, even if I would have gotten accepted to a public school, I would have been paying you know, out-of-state tuition which I'm assuming, you know, there are people from uh, also out-of-state students who, no matter where they go, they happen to pay out-of-state prices. So the price ends up being about the same whether you want to pay an out-of-state student. And also, you know, it just kind of sort of depends on if you only get accepted to a private school, then that's sort of where you have to go. How do you take notes? Uh, I know, I personally, I like to, like, the professors will post, like, objectives, and if I, if I go to lecture, or even if I don't go to lecture, when I uh, go through the lessons or some of the 
faster. I'll fill out the objectives as, as we go along and try to, that way like I'm like looking, I'm constantly looking for something as I'm teaching, rather than just like sitting there passively just listening and absorbing and stuff. That's how I like to take notes. And there's many different methods. I use OneNote right now. Like, I remember in my undergrad, I would study like from the book. It's just a completely different way that we study now being in dental school. Uh, a lot of it's just like on computer, PowerPoint slides. It's a different pace. So that's really just been our big adjustment, trying to figure out how to study. And you, you'll get accustomed to it, but it just takes some time. I like PDF documents, Word documents, PDF editors. Writing things down, such things. Oh. <laughs> uh, Yosef asks, how old are you? And I'm in my first year of dental school and you look like my dad. <laughs> Sorry, dude. Who is this? <laughs> Who is this guy? Dude, I'm only 27 and I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 27, man. I don't know what to tell you. So it looks like it says, I just applied this cycle and I want to just get an idea as to when you had your application 100%. For me, I would say I had everything completed by the end of July, not including supplemental. Supplemental is a little bit tricky sometimes because I usually have to wait, or my experience as the schools that I applied to, I had to wait for them to get back to me to tell me, go online and submit this uh, supplemental application. And I think it was around probably in the August-ish that I had all my supplemental stuff. And as far as interviews, I think it was, I can't exactly remember, but it was a couple weeks. I would say at least like two, three weeks after I submitted my supplemental that I got my first interview. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, my first uh, interview invitation. And uh, about acceptances, you know, December 1st. Okay, let's see. So, so I'm doing my BDS in India, and I want to do my MDS. So I'm assuming that's like a, like a dental therapist. United States. The question is, um, I'm doing my BDS in India and I want to do my MDS for abroad. What is the process? I can't give you a really good answer because I didn't do a BDS or an MDS because it's an international degree. Um, but to give you kind of an idea of if you were to, to actually go into the US and you wanted to uh, practice dentistry here, I know there are some master's programs um, for dental science and they, I think they call them dental therapists. And I would imagine they're probably pretty close to what uh, what dentists, doctor programs actually have. So a year of chemistry, year of biology, year of organic chemistry, and a year of physics at the minimum. Uh, there's some other things as well, like microbio and nat phys, those types of things. But I'm pretty sure if I was to go with my gut, I'd say you probably have to do those things. I think it depends on whether you are a practicing dentist in your home country. Because I think, well, you mentioned that there are programs here that are I think, like international like dentists That's or something right. like that. But they accept international dentists into dental schools here and their programs are like two years or something like that. And they become licensed to practice in the United States. So I guess it just, just, yeah, it just depends on whether you are a practicing dentist in your home country. So How is the workload? Sure. Do you have a lot of free time? <laughs> yeah, the workload's pretty, pretty heavy. Do you have a lot of free time? I mean, you can make free time depending on which. I mean, what kind of grades you want to get? I suppose. <clears throat> like, I mean, to get through dental school, all you have to do is pass like seventy percent, I believe. Yeah. Um, but you know, like we said earlier, we want to keep our offers open, so you know, I used a lot of my time to you know, just study. Gotta get yourself some me time. You know, you're gonna drive yourself crazy oh, yeah, if you just study all the time. I like to study hard during the week because I like my weekends so you know if I you know really study hard and I focus during the week then I feel like I have a little bit more time through the weekends to myself that doesn't mean I take like the entire day off sometimes or that I slack off during the weekends but I may not study as much. yeah and I may not study as much you know, you know, Saturdays and Sundays I think I usually devote about four to five hours on Saturday and Sunday to studying and then you know the rest of the I mean, I, I do some fun things on the weekends. I really like to mountain bike. That's one of my hobbies. Um, and so I'll usually go for a bike ride Saturday morning. And then Sunday for me is like a family day. So I try to do as little as possible if I can on Sundays. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Just hit hard on the weekdays. There definitely is like free time. You just have to schedule it. I think scheduling is really a big thing also. If you don't have what you're doing that day scheduled in and actually planned out your day, you're not gonna be as effective. And then you're gonna end up realizing that you have no time. That, that's when the problems happen. You're not, 
crash the schedule. This would it be hard finding a new job? For example, let's say if I go to dental school in New York, but I want to start a life in Texas, would it be hard finding a new job? Depending on what school you go to, like let's say you did go to New York and you wanted to go to Texas, you'd have to take different licensing exams. So it's totally possible. It's just taking a little bit more time actually to take that test. You don't really have too much freedom choosing which school you get into because once you apply to those schools, it's just getting in is your biggest goal. So once you get in that place and you graduate from there, you can practice right there or if you want to go to a different state, you have to take a different licensing exam. Not all states are like that, but if you're from California like I am, you're, and if you're from out of California like in school and you go back to California, you have to take extra licensing exams just to practice in California. <laughs> So biology, biochemistry, or biotechnology, what would prepare me more for dental school? So I was a biology major. I was an exercise physiology major. I was also biology. I was biology. So I guess most of us here are biology, but as far as what would prepare you more for dental school, I feel like anything that takes a lot of, you know, sciences, there are some, you know, of course you can get you know, business degrees or arts degree, you know, there are a couple of people in the class who don't have a biology background. But, I mean, it's, they could totally do, I mean, so they could, it might be a little bit more struggle. I don't know, I haven't talked to them, but. I've heard it, I've heard for a few of them, yeah, it's, it's the basic science classes are the harder for them. Yeah, but, I mean, if you want to go that route, I don't feel like it would hurt you that much, because if you're studying and you're putting in the time, you'll get there, you'll be fine. But for me, I feel like the, my science background does help out a lot, especially since most of my electives were like extra science classes. There were a couple of classes from the beginning of the semester that I felt like, oh yeah, I kind of, I remember this one undergrad. There you go. Oh, mine? Nice. Oh, nice. I'm an undergrad student who wants to be a dentist, but my hands tend to get a little shaky. Ryan, I'm so glad you asked this question. This is actually one of the things that I was uh, a little bit nervous about as well before I thought I could even go into dentistry. I was thinking, man, dentists have like the most precise motor skills and like manual dexterity and that, that kind of thing. Yeah, if your hands get shaky when you're nervous or you haven't eaten in a while, that just means you're human. All of us have that same issue. When you haven't eaten in a while, that just means that you're hypoglycemic <laughs> and uh, th that happens to everybody. So one thing that you'll learn when you get to dental school is uh, the fulcrum finger. When you actually work on a patient or in our case a type of because we're still in a uh, sim clinic you'll learn to actually use your ring finger to actually put somewhere on the, the patient's patient's mouth whether it's their mouth or another tooth or something like that and it helps to stabilize your instrument so that way you can actually work um, on the area that you need to work on so that's totally fine don't worry about it when is it when is it a good time to start shadowing and volunteering now now mm -hmm. <laughs> right now as early as you can and keep track yeah keep track of the hours yeah. absolutely yeah, because you'll have to answer that on the ad SAS if you report the base. I guess from previous comments, you can tell that time management is my weak point. How do you handle that? Well, I think it's a good idea to always realize like what you have to do and how if you slack or procrastinate, you're probably not going to get as much out of it as you need to. This is, yeah, this could probably be an even more in detail question. I'm glad you asked that. I might actually make a video on this in the future just because this is such an important topic to actually know how to manage your time. Hopefully we can get back to you on that. Do you get in a dental school right after you finish your 12th grade? No. So what most dental students, how, they, how most of them get in is that they graduate high school and then they do four years of an undergrad and then they, apply, or they, then they get into a dental school. That's the United States. I don't know where you're from, but so yeah, I mean, we're, we're from the U.S. We didn't, couldn't tell. I think it's probably pretty obvious. But the U.S., four years undergrad, four years dental school. That's it. All of that is after high school. Congrats on your white coat ceremony. Woo! <laughs> yes. <laughs> when did you start writing a personal statement? So I wrote it probably like a month or two before the June 1st date when it opened, the ad SAS date opened. I think it really just kind of depends on like, if you're good at writing. I don't know, like if you're good with that sort of a thing, then you obviously don't need as much time in order to write. But for me, I probably could have used a little bit more time because I turned in my ad SAS like probably a month and a half after it opened. And I feel like that might've been a little bit late 
to turn everything in. It took a while for me to get back from some of the schools. You can start working on it now. Yeah, the earlier you start, the better. I, I feel like I kind of started-ish by in January, but I didn't really like touch it. Like I didn't really didn't start like diving deep into my freshman statement until about like two to three months. Yeah. Yeah, like two to three months before June. Well, actually July. Yeah, a couple of months before uh, and I, uh, I, the ad sets, I turned in the ad sets, and I felt like I was kind of crunching the time. And so the earlier you can start, the better you are. We have Brenda. Okay, how many research hours should I have in order to be a good candidate for dental school? I didn't do any research hours, and I feel like I was still a good candidate for dental school. I didn't do any either. I did, I did a, a little research. I did research for like two months. You know, it's, it wasn't like required or anything. I was just like, oh, it'd be nice to put on my dental application. Yeah, it's research. Something to set me out a little bit, set me yeah. apart from other applicants. We all got in and we didn't really do anything, so. It's not a huge deal. It depends on the school you apply to, I think, too. Yeah, right? some, that's true. Some schools are really heavy on research. So I would check that with the schools. Um, and you can get a kind of a sense of which schools are bigger on research based on their mission statements. So check the mission statements of the schools that you want to apply to if you are interested, in, if you or if you've already done research. That'll help. Does going to a more prestigious or selective dental school give me a better advantage at matching into a competitive residency program? and could a really good DAT score make up for an average GPA? To answer the second question, yes. So if you have an average GPA, um, average is somewhere between like three to 3.5. Actually, that's probably more on the lower side. Three, four to three, five is probably an average-ish GPA. And that's not really, you don't really want to be an average applicant. You want to be a good applicant. So you want to strive for three sevens and above. So yeah, if you have a three, four or a three, five, and you get a 21 or a 22 on the DAS, you're in the pocket. That's awesome. That'll definitely make up for it. Now, as far as going to a more prestigious or selected dental school, matching you at a, a specific residency program, of course, we don't, we haven't gotten there yet. We're still pretty new in the process. But in my own opinion, I feel like maybe. I, I think some residency programs kind of know how how certain dental schools work. But I think what's more important than that is not necessarily the school, but what you have accomplished at the school. All right, what, what was the overall hardest part of getting into dental school? Mm, that's a tough question. The hardest part of getting into dental school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maintaining a, maintaining a good GPA, getting the dad score, studying for that, getting a decent dad score, watching my bank account drop. <laughs> I had a hard time with like trying to, trying to fulfill everything that dental schools wanted because dental schools want so much. Like They expect so much of pre-dental students uh, to actually matriculate into dental school. Like, you have to be good at academics. You have to make sure your GPA is is really good. You have to make sure that you have volunteered and you've not just volunteered like in spurts, but that you're continually volunteering. A lot of them want to see that you've worked throughout school so that way they can see that you can not only handle school, but that you can handle work at the same time. I mean, it's like there's so much. And I, I think not one specific thing was hard for me, but just trying to manage all of it, you know, take care of my family at the same time and have time for them and just, just be everywhere. That was, that was the hardest thing. So Spotlight says, so I'm in my first year of college, but instead of waiting a couple of years to study for the DAP test, I would actually like to start studying now. Uh, so should I buy the materials now? I mean, you could if you want, but the way that it works is after a couple of years, they're gonna have new additions. It could have different changes to the actual test. So if you don't change the material, the most recent material, it, you might not have studied for it and it could affect your grade. If you're not ready to take the DAT and you just want to take it to see what it's like, don't yeah. do it. Don't <laughs> do it. Something that I thought was like impossibly hard on the actual DAT itself was the angle ranking. I know oh, Jet yeah. Boot Camp, I think it's DAT Boot Camp, or some website has like a really good practice angle ranking thing. And I wish I'd done that more. So if you want to prepare, I mean, I would, I'd recommend doing that. If I was to recommend anything, don't buy your materials until you are ready to actually study for that. And you shouldn't be ready to study for the DAT until you have taken Gen Chem, O Chem, and Bio, because those are the, the three subjects for your natural survey, the natural sciences on the DAT. 
um, yeah, just don't do it because then your materials will be outdated and you'll be studying for stuff that might be on the test, but you'll just, you'll do better if you, you don't do that. But the one thing is, yeah, like the perceptual ability test, if you can practice that, there's all sorts of free stuff out there. Um, I know uh, Ari or Ari, the one that does that in camp, he has this game. Have you guys done the, uh, yeah, the Pat the game, game or the Pat Trainer game yeah, or something like that? I'll see if I can find that, that link and I'll actually put the link in the description so you guys can actually find that. And it's pretty cool. I think you guys will like it. But use that. Don't worry about anything else until it's actually time to study. Yeah, you're in your first year of college, so I would just kind of worry about trying to retain all the material, pass my classes, and uh, I mean, if you study hard, you study for the dad, should be, when it comes to time to study for the dad, it should hopefully a little bit easier for you. Now, Bianca is the first year of dental school the hardest. It's pretty hard, but it's doable. Um, I have heard that second year might actually be a little bit harder. I think it also depends on the school you go to. Yeah, for sure. Anthony asks, what is the most important part of the dental school application? Well, we kind of already covered that. Um, the whole thing is important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I can't really answer it any other way than that. It's that the entire application is important and you just have to make sure that you're ready for it. Make sure that your personal statement is as perfect as you can get it for you. Uh, make sure that your GPA is good, otherwise they won't look at it. Make sure that your DAT score is good, otherwise they won't look at it. Make sure you've got shadowing hours or they won't accept you. <laughs> so yeah, the whole thing is important and there really isn't, uh, I don't think there's necessarily a most, the most important part of it. The whole thing is important. Uh, pillow Pants, is he or she too old to apply for dental school? <laughs> yeah, is 30 or 31 too old? Um, you know, absolutely not. There's uh, there's plenty of uh, dental student, D1 students that are 30, I think there's a the lady that's like 40, 41, yeah, 42 yeah. year old. Yeah, yeah that's not yeah, too we have a couple of them with their yeah. example, like 30 plus yeah. Yeah. students here. So, like, I mean, it's a few months. There's another guy that we all hang out with. His name's Stuart. You, you guys have probably seen him in the other videos. <laughs> he, he pops up a lot. He's 30, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's definitely not an issue. And the secondary question to this was also um, will my background in dental assisting help me? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. If dental school is more expensive than medical school, then why did you do dental school? I don't know. I think really the biggest thing was for me, there was actually a lot of free time that you could have once you're done, once you're practicing. You can have a lot of free time with your family, you can set your own schedule, sort of thing. I mean, I, I wanted to be a dentist, I didn't want to be a physician, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's that's really about it. That's, that's going to be a huge, huge decision you're going to have to make in your life is do you want to be a physician or do you want to be an optometrist or do you want to be a dentist or do you want to be something that's not in the health professions? That's, that's totally between you and you. you know, no amount of, of tuition can make that up. I think you should really just follow what you want to do the rest of your life, otherwise you'll kind of be miserable. Okay, how long did it take you to finish the full applications and can you apply before taking uh, so I guess I, we kind of covered a little bit, a little bit of this earlier. It took me about a month and a half or to two months to finish the entire test application. And can you apply before taking the debt? I think you can, um, yeah. but they won't look at your application until you have your debt scores in. So it doesn't really make well to me. It doesn't really make much sense to submit it. So make sure to just take the debt and then submit it afterwards. That's my general rule of thumb. If you're not, if you haven't done everything that you need to do before it's time to apply, don't. Why? Otherwise, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. And it's expensive. It's so expensive to apply. Dr. Funny, how do you keep yourself motivated for studying and how many hours do you spend studying a day? Uh, yeah, there's some times when I'm definitely not motivated to study. And uh, this is one thing that we had, that was actually covered in our orientation when we first started school here is um, types of coping mechanisms there's something that's called a, an avoidance coping mechanism where when you're just kind of like burnt out and you don't want to do anything you just do everything else besides studying and that's the one thing you don't want to do so don't be an avoidant person do what you got to do to get back on the horse and, and just keep studying there's definitely going to be times when that's going to happen but try and relate it to something in your life that is going to make you want to study that thing and that's what I do. Basically, when you're in dental school, there's everything you study is going to be applicable to how you practice, how you go out and practice. And so I just try to remember that, that, you know, someday I'm going to need to remember this. 
how many hours do I spend studying each day? To be honest, I probably don't spend that much time studying a day if you were if you were to put it into like a consecutive amount of time. When I do study, I am making sure that I'm like 100% studying on something and I'm like not, like nothing else exists when I, when I study. I'm just like in the moment right there and I'm basically doing that for like four and a half to five hours a day. When I was in my undergrad, however, <laughs> I was all over the place. I, especially in my first couple of years uh, of undergrad, I was just like, I didn't really know how to study. I felt like I was studying all day, but in reality, I would study for like 20 minutes and I would be on Facebook and I'd like, <laughs> you know, do another 20 minutes and be on YouTube or something. Yeah, there you go. Okay, what do, de what do dental students typically do for rent, health insurance, living expenses? Also, do you have any female classmates who have children? Uh, answer the second question. I think the 41 year old in our class, she has children that are all I don't know if we have any female students that have young children, but I do remember that there was a faculty member that she had a child oh, for yeah. the year, uh, and she said that it was like the hardest thing that she's ever done. So, students that do have children, I, I do know there's other schools that have um, female students that have either like gone into labor halfway through the first semester or the second year or something like that. I do know of some people and my heart goes out to them because that's like, I can't even imagine how hard that must be. And so for the first question, uh, what do students typically do for rent? Well, I, for my rent, I, I'm renting a room at a house, I have two other roommates, and it's like a mile off campus, so you know, it's a pretty good deal. So I went there. Well, I mean, I also have roommates and I think that's a good way to go to sort of save a lot of money. Um, because you can just do split the rent or utility. Yeah, and you can just save the money that way. I'm living on campus, so it's still it's pretty cheap. I, I just live in a little studio apartment, so I basically do anything I want in this little confined spot. I just treat it as a place that I just eat and sleep and go to bed and I kind of repay. This is my place. Uh, it's humongous. It's bigger than what we really need. But um, I wanted to have a nice place for my family to be at when I was at school. And one of the nice things about actually having a family is you have the ability to get all sorts of different benefits. Um, and so we have discounts on our electric, discounts on gas, we've, um, we've got all sorts of discounts. My wife is really good at, at um, finding those discounts. But as far as actually paying for these things, it's loans, guys. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah there's no way that we could afford what we're work. Or work. Yeah, even if, no we, even if we had a full-time job, there's no way in heck we could pay for pay for our education, so loans all the way. Other students, they have scholarships, um, either through you know, the military or through like the National Health Service Corps, that kind of thing. But the majority of students will live off of loans. How long do you think it will take to pay off for college and dental school debt? Um, I think it really just depends on your habits, really. That was actually one of the questions that I asked during my interview. I was like, what's the average? and what's the soonest amount that someone's actually paid off their, their loans. And they said it really just depends on the person, but the earliest we've seen is like two years, wow. which is insane. I can't even like fathom how they did that. Yeah, Just living like a student, paying it off as soon as you can. My wife and I are on a 10 year plan after um, after dental school. We want to pay off our loans in 10 years. Um, and just to give you an idea with what we're paying for our tuition and fees and everything here. Uh, on a 10 year plan, I will be paying over $5,000 a month just to service the loans. Uh, so that doesn't include living expenses or anything like that. Now with that being said, um, you know, we, we said before that we're getting, we're going to have an incredible clinical experience when we get to our third and fourth year. And so when we get out and actually practice, first of all, we can bypass a residency because we're doing things that residents are doing. Um, and secondly, uh, we'll have the skills necessary to actually start off as a, as a successful dentist as long as we apply ourselves. And so that's really important um, to keep in mind is that we need to be most focused on our clinical skills right now so that way Later, we can take care of our families and, and uh, you know, take care of our financial situation. It all works out, man. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Let's see. Last question here. So JR says, have you seen any non-native English speakers in dental school? Whoa. Well, I, well, I kind of grew up learning English and Spanish at the same time. But there are definitely a lot of classmates who, yeah, we do have a lot of classmates that are from 
different countries yeah. even. So we have a good demographic, we have a good mix of people from, you know, different parts of the world. So definitely don't worry about that. As long as you can speak English or speak English at well, then that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, there's plenty of uh, students in our class that are not native speaking. And actually there's professors in our in our dental school that are yes. non native speaking. So yeah, don't worry about it. It'll probably be a little bit of a, a learning curve maybe, but I think everybody has that it's uh, you know, in some aspect of their life. So you'll get what, what you need out of dental school. It'll be fine. I think uh, I think that wraps it up. So Thank you so much for all of the questions that you guys asked. Um, hopefully that helps you guys out. So thank you so much for watching. You guys are awesome. We'll see you in the next video. Keep living the dream.